Hi, thanks for coming to Tick Report, to the Tick Talk for September 2020. This is a particularly good day for me because what I'm going to present to you today is a conversation that I had with Dr. Dan Sunshine. Dan Sunshine literally wrote the book on ticks, and he was my guest for this interview that we conducted a couple of weeks ago. And now we've edited it for what will end up probably being a couple of different tick talks. Dan is a giant in the field. He wrote the book Biology of Ticks in 1991 and 1993, and that stood as the definitive text until 2013 when he wrote the second edition of that two volume set, uh, in that case as, a two, as an edited volume with multiple authors. He's among scientists, you know, if scientists kept trader cards like baseball cards, I would want a Dan Sun and Shine card in my collection because he's just a, uh, not only a top quality scientist that does great work and has made fantastic contributions by his basic research and his papers and his, his the books that he's written, he's also just a genuinely good human being and always supportive of younger scientists. I've on numerous occasions reached out to him for, with questions and he never hesitates to give a, a response, a thorough response very generous with his time very generous with um with sharing his ideas and you know for a, a person that's coming up through the ranks that's uh that, that's very much appreciated and unfortunately not always commonplace so he's a great scientist and part of the reason we had such a long conversation is his his career has you know spanned a few decades and so he's known giants in the field as well so where Dan Sunshine is to me, a fellow named Harry Hoekstraal was to Dan Sunshine, that kind of mentor back in the 60s and 70s. And so um, Dan sh shares some stories of, uh, about Harry and uh, his experiences with Harry in Egypt and Africa, and it's just great. But um, that content was probably a little bit more than one TikTok, so I'm gonna link that to a YouTube where you can go out and check out those conversations that I had about, not only about Harry Hoekstraal, but also about uh, Yuri Balashov, who's a R Russian scientist, and Dan shares some interesting anecdotes about his experiences during the Cold War traveling to Russia. Uh, and I'll just, I won't give anything away there. Um, so there's a little bit extra in this case for this TikTok, um, and we encourage you to go to our uh, YouTube channel, which is Tick Report Media and you'll find this and past videos that we've put together for TikTok. But for now, please watch the TikTok that uh, Dan, Dan Sunshine's presenting on a variety of topics. He is an authority on a variety of topics. Dan and I are gonna be live watching the, the recording with you and we'll answer questions in the chat line in real time. So thanks again for coming and enjoy this version of TikTok. It's really a, a special treat. Pleasure to have you at TikTok, and to tell you a little bit about the history of what I remember when I was first introduced to your work. So I started research on ticks and tick-borne diseases in 1992. I was uh, then finishing up a master's in population genetics, and my interest was in mammalian populations, and in particular in white-footed mice. So that's how uh, the connection with Lyme. And for my next uh, stage, I decided to, to study ticks. I had been working with folks at the Maine Medical Center, um, collecting ticks for them. And so I decided to join the, the laboratory of Andrew Spielman at Harvard School of Public Health. And Andrew became a, a mentor for a couple of years there, along with his young protege, Sam Telford. And having no backgrounds in, background in entomology or, or ticks, they immediately gave me what they called the Bible, which was... Uh, your book, The Biology of Ticks, which I think first publication, first edition was 1991. That's correct. So it was pretty fresh off the, it, off the, uh, yeah, that was volume press. one. Volume one. And then volume two came shortly thereafter? Uh, 93. 93. Um, so that was my first introduction to, to, uh, to, to your work. And um, of course, you are a emeritus professor at Old Dominion University. Right. And now working at Lar Laboratory of Malaria and Vector Research at NIAID at the National right, Institutes right. of Health. Working as a volunteer, I'm a, I'm a guest researcher. Oh, great. So, um, 
So welcome, and thank you for agreeing to do this. Um, oh, I should mention that, although it's somewhat apocryphal, while you wrote the Bible, you wrote a second edition of the Bible in 2013, right? So Yeah, with, I promise uh, never to do that again. It was, uh, <clears throat> I told people that writing the first edition was like building the pyramids all by myself. <laughs> that pyramid. <clears throat> and um, under intense pressure, I conceded to... Uh, do it again with certain provisions, the provision being that it would be an edited work, not solely by myself. Mm -hmm. And so we corralled a lot of different people and gathered together 34 chapters in two volumes. And the list of different uh, collaborators um, was pretty impressive from many regions of the world, not just the U.S. And so uh, that brought it up to date as far as 2014. And if they pressure me to do another one, I'll, um, I'll think very carefully whether the uh, nurse, nursing home provisions allow for something like that. Because <laughs> that's <good. laughs> I think at that point we would need three or four volumes and 100 collaborators and so on. It was, the pace of, of knowledge has accelerated to such an incredible degree. Yeah, well, it's great. I'm so glad that it's there. I mean, it's such a resource for, for those of us that, um, that, that study ticks. I think one thing that would come as a surprise to this audience and to many people is that prior to that publication in 1991 of the first edition, ticks weren't, well, for the decade, a couple decades preceding that, ticks weren't real high on the list of public health concerns. They were more arguably agricultural concerns. And so before Lyme disease, it was mosquitoes that we worried about, um, maybe the cousins of ticks, the mites and, and the lice and such, but ticks That's weren't right. such. Yeah, Oxford came to me. Um, basically, they wanted to um, have a greater presence in uh, <clears throat> health-related issues, not just vector-borne diseases, but um, they didn't want to just be seen as, a, uh, as an arts and uh, historian and... Um, English and so on, and they wanted to move in more in that direction, and they sensed that the Lyme disease presented a uh, an avenue of interest. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was in the late 80s when um, a disease had just barely reached the point of being a re, um, reportable disease to the CDC. So um, we went ahead with that, and that was the excuse to wrap it all together in that monumental effort two volumes. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, Steve, if, if that's okay with you, i uh, just give a brief introduction of what ticks are all about Great. and uh, point out that most people who um, have not had a very intensive education in this subject may not realize that they're not insects. Um, I've had any number of papers rejected <clears throat> by uh, so-called expert reviewers saying, this is very interesting work, but it's, so what? It's just another insect. So even supposedly knowledgeable scientists frequently miss the fact that ticks are more closely related to uh, spiders and, and uh, scorpions and so on. So they're members of the class Arachnida, and they're in the same group as mites. Some folks believe ticks are nothing more than big mites, but we'll leave that argument to others. And there are over 900 species, and the largest group is in the family Exotidae with hard ticks. And the most important in the hard tick group is the what we call the prostriata, which is one genus, the genus Exodes. And this is the guy that we're most concerned about. So if you want to look at a rogues gallery, what do ticks look like? Here are some photos. Several of these would take, and the two on the left, that's the Lyme disease tick, Xodes scapularis. This is the top view of the female and the bottom view the same. And this one's the American dog tick. And the one over here is another hard tick, the Lone Star tick, so-called because of that white dot on its back end of its sputum, as we call it, that hard shield. And the other kind of ticks are the soft ticks shown below, fast feeders, and have a totally different lifestyle, different, different biology. So the guys that are most important to us right here, the Lyme disease ticks, 
because there are about 12 different major tick-borne diseases in the United States. Of those, six of them are transmitted by the Lyme disease tick, Ixodes scapularis, the so-called black-legged tick, a common name that some people use is the deer tick, but they are much more than just parasites of deer. And among the most important is, of course, the Lyme disease agent itself, but also human granulocytic anaplasmosis. Uh, that's a tongue tire, but it's a kind of rickettsial group tick. And also another kind of relapsing fever. We think of relapsing fever mainly associated with soft ticks, but there is one that can be transmitted by Xodes scapularis. And a malaria-like parasite, not all of the tick-borne pathogens are bacteria. Some of them, in this case, are malaria-like parasites called human babesiosis, and even viruses, in which case we have the Powassan virus, somewhat related to the European tick-borne encephalitis, Europe and Asia, and also a Bartonellosis parasite. It's another category of bacteria-like organisms. So this is a bad actor. This, this guy can transmit a lot of different things, including some of them simultaneously. There are ticks that have found occasionally with as many as three different pathogens in its body at the same time. You don't want a tick bite from this species. Now this map shows briefly where these different diseases are present. And uh, no surprise, most of them are in the eastern United States. The large purple area is where the Lyme disease pathogens are most prevalent. Not necessarily where all the human cases are, but that's usually they correlate one to the other. But we also have um, a lot of so-called Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I would caution that term because there's a lot of evidence that that is um, confused with other tick-borne rickettsia that also cause a mild illness but are not exactly the same pathogen. They are confused together a lot. And so all those red dots may represent more than the classical Rocky Mountain spotted fever we've seen in the in past decades. And then the green, you notice the large area up here, that's the uh, tick-borne anaplasmosis, especially by the black-legged tick. So to give you some idea of what's been happening over the last few decades, this only goes back to 2004. During this period of almost 20 years now, well, 17, 18 years, there's been a, not absolutely steady, but the trend line clearly is an increase and increase to virtually doubling and then tripling of the prevalence of um, these tick-borne diseases, with Lyme disease being by far the most important. Lyme disease cases were over 40,000 in 2017. It dropped down to 33,000 in 2018. But you can see by far the major component of all the tick-borne diseases in the United States. Those are the years in which we have um, specific confirmed uh, medical knowledge. But CDC estimates that the true number that's out there is easily 10 times those number of confirmed cases. And so we have to estimate that in any given year, there are more than 350, perhaps 400,000 episodes or experience or infections with Lyme disease, not all of which necessarily result in a clinical diagnosis, not all of which even ever see a doctor. But if left untreated, may lead to long-term sequelae that the individual may wish they had taken advantage of medical care early on instead of letting it go. When we look here, this gives us a more precise image of um, where current cases of Lyme disease rated on the basis of their level of incidence, that is numbers per unit of population, say thousands of cases per million people and so on. And notice the, the black areas are the areas of high incidence, and that includes most of New England, including in, on into southern Maine, and certainly all of Massachusetts and Connecticut and Rhode Island and so on. Much of Southern New York, including Long Island, 
New Jersey, you can see lots of it in Pennsylvania and Delaware and Maryland and just to the northern end of Virginia and after that it drops off dramatically so that um, we get down to the southern states there's a very few cases for reasons that really are not clear nobody can fully and satisfactorily explain that difference because we know the vector is out there the deer tick or black-legged tick extends all the way to the southern tip of Florida and yet there are still relatively few cases and the other major center is in um, the north central United States mainly in Michigan and Wisconsin uh, northern Michigan especially northern Wisconsin but all over that area and then again spotted locate localities all around these other areas where the environment is really unsatisfactory for large populations of Ixodes scapularis. It, that species is a woodland and forest edge and, and uh, related species requiring uh, high humidity, uh, high relative humidity and mild, much milder conditions that are not usually found on the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. So one of the previous tick talks we've done is about the differences between northern and southern uh, Ixodes scapularis. And I touched a little bit in that talk about the history of that and the fact that at one point they were separate species and then they were later synonymized because it was recognized that they, they perhaps constitute a single species and not two. And then there was, of course, a big debate about that. But I'm wondering what your opinion is about the differences in the biology of those northern and southern tick species with respect to uh, important factors like maybe their host preference, the length of the life cycle, and the impact that might have on the transmission of Borrelia in the respect. I'm glad you brought that up. The belief that there are two different species has now been pretty well discredited. Um, credit to Jim Oliver, who has only recently passed away, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. conducting the, the um, benchmark biological experiments that showed that they do interbreed freely and they are viable through multiple generations. He carried it out as far as five different generations showing that they were fully biologically um, the same species. But that doesn't mean that they are behaviorally the same. And there's evidence that in the Northeast, the nymphal stage, which is the one that transmits Remember in the biology of this tick, larvae acquire pathogen from infected animals like small mammals such as white-footed mice. And then when they molt into nymphs, the nymphs, when they seek a blood meal, they're the ones, that's the stage that transmits. Those nymphs climb pretty high into the vegetation so that they will get up onto larger animals such as about the size of dogs, raccoons, uh, medium-sized mammals, not just you know, clinging just very close to the ground where they might encounter only small rodents and shrews and other small animals of that sort, and in, including people, including humans. In the southeast, to get a Ixodes scapularis nymph, you really need to crawl on your belly very close to the ground with a flag or a, uh, some other collecting device and get your claws very close to the ground to pick up any at all. They're very hard to find. They just don't climb up high. And we don't understand why it could be weather related. It's a much warmer, hotter climate. But in the Southeast, there are a lot of lizards and they are refractory. Some, I think Andy Spielman was the, um, the author of this concept of zooprophylaxis. By feeding on lizards, the, uh, the ticks were getting fed, but the Lyme uh, bacteria were being destroyed. And deer do not carry the bacteria. Ticks feeding on deer, the bacteria get into the deer blood and deer blood is completely refractory to uh, Borreliosis. No Borrelia grow in the bodies of the deer. So they've got to get into mice or other animals of that sort or any other humans are generally considered a dead end. Uh, these other wildlife in order for it to perpetuate in the wild fauna. And uh, the more these things go on, the less that's likely to, you know, those animals such as lizards be refractory. That's one explanation. It's a weak one. And I think there's a lot more to be learned about the behavior relative to this. We've done studies where the percentage of infection in ticks in Virginia, before I left, we carry out studies there, were in the low, low digits. They barely ever getting up to 10%, and usually much lower than that. Whereas in, um, as you probably well know, in Massachusetts, 
not uncommon to find areas where it's 25 to 50 percent. I think the interesting thing or the, the bigger picture of of this is, and this is certainly not telling you anything, but many people in public health fail to understand the complexity of the life cycle and the way one goes about determining risk of something like Lyme disease, where if it were a airborne zoonosis, or sorry, airborne uh, anthroponosis, for example, wherever there's infected people, there's, there's a risk to uninfected people. In this case, for vector-borne diseases, there have to be ticks, but there also has to be reservoirs. There has to be pathogen. And we know that in the Southeast, for one reason or another, not all of those things are at the same level that they are in the Northeast. So the risk factors are different, certainly, right. in different parts of the country, despite the distribution of the ticks. Something that we've been doing for several years now is testing ticks. We've been providing it as, the, as a public service. And I'll tell you honestly, when we started doing it, I didn't know what the value of it was. But I'm now convinced that it's really a good way not only to assess individual risk, but also population risk, because you can look at where people are getting bitten by those ticks that are of the correct species, who's getting bitten long enough for transmission to take place, and which pathogens are positive. So despite the fact that the CDC thinks that there's no value in testing ticks, we sort of become, become convinced that it's one of the earliest ways to assess the riskiness of a particular tick exposure. I couldn't agree more. The, the extent to which ticks are infected is the first level of concern, the first risk factor for the human population. The extent to which ticks bite people, of course, is the second level because that's the one that's going to carry them into them. So if you're walking down a, um, a woodland trail or a, uh, you know, backwoods road, dirt road, where uh, a lot of vegetation and it's July, and nymphs are out, there's a good chance you're going to be bitten. If nymphs are very abundant and they're 25% infected, you're going to get a pretty good chance of a tick bite that's going to carry the Lyme pathogen into your body. Second question is, how fast do you recognize you've had a tick bite? We can, we can get into this in more detail later, the ticks are masters at silencing the bite site so that you're not aware you've been bitten. Very different than a deer fly or even a mosquito, where you have itch and pain and absolute knowledge that you got to deal with it. And so people have to check carefully afterwards. They have to prepare for the trip, wear um, long trousers, for example, tuck their pants into their boots if they're wearing boots or buy shoes, strap um, whatever, like um, some kind of tape around it. Uh, I love duct tape for that purpose. And spray the devil out of it with uh, insecticide or better yet, uh, repellent. And even so, be aware when they come back from their trip and they take a shower afterwards to check not only themselves, but ask a partner to look all these hidden places where ticks might have found a home. Ticks like, since we're hairless, Ticks will climb along the body till they find a, uh, a pressure point, usually our belt line. When we sit down behind the knee in your crotch, places like that, that's where we're least likely to discover them. And so the longer the tick is feeding, 48 hours is considered to be the, uh, the minimum threshold for transmission, the better the chance of transmission. If you, even if you get bitten, if you can get that tick off the first day, even, even by early the second day, your chances of transmission are diminished to almost zero, you're, you're fine. But it takes an alert uh, individual to be very cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. I, I think what you're, the service that you're providing will eventually get to the public health community. Uh, I applaud what you're doing and urge you to continue it full time. It's great. Briefly, the, the clinical features, how do you know you've had been bitten, how do you know you've gotten Lyme disease? The first stop, first thing that people see is the typical erythema migraine, the so-called bullseye rash. And the figures in the middle, on the middle top, are classical examples of a bullseye rash. Warning, there are numerous cases where it is atypical. There may be a rash that doesn't have the classic bullseye, and worse yet, there may not even be a rash. Or the may the rash may have disappeared by the time that the patient, if he is a patient, 
who will visit the doctor complaining about aches and fever will no longer see it because it's a fleeting phenomenon. The later uh, sequelae are shown below that can happen is arthritis and Bell's palsy and nasty outcomes like that. I don't want to get into the issue of whether there's such a thing as chronic Lyme disease. We'll leave that to the medical community. But there may indeed be sequelae. I think that that's indisputable. That some people have lifelong issues with the results of a single tick bite. I want to talk briefly about difference between hard ticks and soft ticks, some biological features. Um, and this is a simple table that illustrates those points. Biological features, hard ticks have only one nymphal stage, soft ticks have several. The feeding frequency, the females feed only once and they engorge slowly to enormous amounts. A single deer tick may feed up to a hundred times its original pre-feeding weight and synthesize new body as it grows along, new, new integument in order to expand. Whereas the soft ticks feed rapidly, often in minutes, much as 30 to as much as 120 minutes, but they're rapid feeders and they can only grow to the extent that they can, ex they can stretch their cuticles. They cannot make new cuticle during that point and so their expansion is limited by the cuticular stretching capabilities. The other point about hard ticks is they cement themselves in place. Hard ticks attach, they don't bite, they, they literally embed themselves in the skin and secrete materials that coalesce together to form a powerful cement. So when you try to pull a tick off that's been attached for several days, you're gonna rip and tear the skin, it's going to bleed, because that cement will hold it in place. The holdfast, which we call the hypostome, is a weak holdfast. It, it cannot withstand the power and, and pulling of, a, of your fingers or the host scratching it off and so on. But with that cement, no amount of, of simple scratching is likely to get it off easily. It'll happen, but it takes a, a lot of effort. Whereas the soft ticks can't do that. They don't make cement. The hard ticks made only once, in the case of exodes, they are pre-mated, or they may mate on the host if they haven't found a male previously. And then they drop off and they lay thousands of eggs, a huge, huge egg mass is shown below. The figure below is for the American dog tick, but it's similar in, the, in exodes as well. Whereas the soft ticks lay eggs many times, they feed many times, and they can live for many, many years. The life cycle of ticks is amazing. People are not aware of it. <clears throat> and um, you can put ticks in a vial and put them away in the incubator and come back a year later and they're still alive. They, they feed, they digest that blood meal slowly, except the female, which will digest it much more rapidly in order to lay these huge amounts of eggs. So the other important information is their life cycle. And in terms of tick-borne disease, especially Lyme disease, we need to appreciate that there is no transovarial transmission. These ticks do not transmit the pathogens from one generation to another without a host. They acquire it each year again from wildlife, especially small mammals in nature. So the eggs hatch in the spring, larvae emerge in the summer, and they climb very, very small amounts, just enough that they could capture, um, they can cling to small rodents that are foraging. And if they encounter a white-footed mouse that is infectious, it has uh, Borrelia burgdorferi in its blood, they become infected. They can also get infected by feeding on shrews, rice rats, a whole wide, whole group of different kinds of small mammals. Mostly they're small mammals. And those larvae then go into a uh, phase called diapause as the days get shorter and cooler. And they overwinter the molt the following spring as the days warm up again. And they reemerge as infected nymphs. The infected nymphs then attach to people 
dogs, any kind of larger animals, even livestock in the late spring and summer when they transmit the pathogens. So the moral of the story here is larvae acquire and nymphs transmit. The nymphs efficiently transmit to all these different hosts if allowed to feed the repletion. Those nymphs that complete feeding drop off and they molt. So now those molted adults that emerge in the same year, but now in the fall from the nymphal blood meal will rise up in usually late October, November, and December to feed on still larger animals such as deer and humans if they happen to be out hunting or camping in fall and winter and their dogs and so on. And they get their meal from mostly deer and they then drop off and they delay egg laying until the following spring to complete the cycle. So you can see how this is going around. You follow the blue line from egg to larva to nymph to adult and back to egg and larva. Now in this next image, this is taken from our paper on the um, nature communications description of the uh, genome of the deer tick. It talks about how different pathogens are transmitted through the body of the tick and some of the uh, molecules that play a role. The important information about Lyme disease is that it, the bacteria, which are known as spirochetes, grow in the digestive tract. So the larval blood meal acquires them and they reside in the midgut, that portion of the tick's digestive tract, where they latch on to a particular receptor known as TROPSA, T-R-O-P-S-A, tick receptor out of surface protein A. It's the receptor for a lipoprotein on the surface of the uh, Lyme bacteria. And having latched onto that, they're able to survive the molt through the nymphal stage. Other ticks, such as American dog ticks and still other tick species, may also acquire these bacteria, but they don't have that specific receptor. And so when those ticks molt to their ne next life stage, the bacteria are lost. And so they are no longer infectious. Well, going back to the deer tick, after molting, the um, bacteria that are in the midgut, when they sense incoming blood, now begin to proliferate tremendously, very rapidly, and start migrating out of the midgut into the ticks circulating blood, which you call hemolymph. And there they um, migrate throughout the body. They manage to coat themselves with a, uh, a substance known as plasminogen, which they've captured from the original host in the blood meal. That breaks down into plasmin, which is a, uh, an enzyme that breaks down the uh, spaces between tissues. But the ticks are, I mean, the uh, bacteria are also now expressing a molecule on their outer surface called outer surface protein C. They downgrade, downgrade A so they can escape the midgut and upgrade C, outer surface protein C or OSC, which when they arrive at the salivary glands will then bind to certain receptors in the uh, saliva, SALP15 is a case in point. They use those salivary proteins to facilitate their migrate into the migration into the salivary glands. And with that advantage, they are then passed those that survive the transit. Many of the bacteria are destroyed as they pass through the um, hemolymph, but the few that survive in the salivary glands can now be transmitted to the new host. All this process takes about seven, uh, 48 hours to 72 hours. There's quite a bit of controversy about and the exact length of time, but there, there is no argument that it doesn't happen in the same day. Other pathogens that the tick transmits can happen, can pass more quickly as some of those others that I mentioned here in this figure, such as anaplasma, tick-borne flaviviruses, that's the um, Watson virus, and so on. Um, this incredibly complex image is an illustration of what's going on in the skin of the host when the tick bites. So you can see on the left, upper left-hand corner, tick's mouth parts. You can see the, the hypostome label there. The palps stay outside, but you can see the hypostome with a groove down the center. And the hypostome 
contains this food canal that allows saliva to penetrate down into the host uh, skin, into the dermis. It passes through the uh, epidermis, and the tick's target is deep into the dermis. Saliva then floods into the area there, and this saliva is a is is your favorite drugstore is full of all the different kinds of medicines that you've ever been told to purchase, plus a few others that thought might be helpful. And they have all these long names like histone 4 and salp 225 rather and salp 20 and so on. The other thing that's happening in response to all these tick-borne molecules is an array of immune cells that are coming in to combat it. So the purpose of all these tick salivary molecules is to accomplish a number of things. One is to suppress the early uh, sensations of itch and pain so that we're, we're dealing with silent feeding, create an anticoagulant so that the uh, blood doesn't coagulate, also open up the blood vessels so you need vasodilation, also counteract the onset of any immune response so you want to block complement. That's a major, major component of the uh, ticks activity. And secrete cement. So it's, it's binding itself in place. It's salivating molecules that are what we call anti-hemostatic. So the, the uh, initial response to a wound, say you get a, uh, a splinter in your skin, is to uh, wall off that wound site to prevent, or to let a lot of platelets arrive and platelets de they secrete uh, molecules that initiate the coagulation cascade. Coagulation then prevents a massive hemorrhage, so there's less edema, and these blood vessels then squeeze together, they, they kind of collapse, so you shorten the blood flow into there. And these are what we call hemostatic mechanisms of hemostasis. The idea is to prevent the wound from being highly injurious and also wound healing begins to take place. The tick's job is to counter all that. So the purpose of all of these salivary molecules is anti-hemostatic. The other thing that's happening is the initial response to the wound begins with the arrival of a whole panoply of different immune cells. Some macrophages are among the earliest ones. Monocytes escape from the blood vessels, trans transfer into um, you know, monocyte, <clears throat> macrophages. There are resident uh, dendrite cells, cells that capture elements of the foreign material. So there are antigen presenting cells that eventually transfer this to a whole complex series of uh, cytokines to uh, B cells and the draining lymph nodes to make antibody. All this of course takes quite a long time, days involved. And all this is being captured in this very complex image. I think um, that last point is, is really the take home that this all takes a while. This is a, a complex system that's evolved ostensibly like an arms race between a tick and its salivary proteins and its midgut proteins and its feeding apparatus and a human and its exosurfaces and its immune system. And there's really been an ebb and a flow through millions of years of evolution that have facilitated this ability of this ectoparasite to make use of, of our blood. And the fact that it's got so many steps and it takes so long is the thing that I think sometimes gets wrapped into a very simple public health message, which is take ticks off as quickly as you can. So yeah. many people will push back on that and say, nope, I'm pretty sure I was bit by a tick and, and you know, that tick was only on me for a few hours and I got Lyme disease. The biological plausibility is such that really it, it's going to take a while before whatever's in that tick comes out of that tick and into you. Right. Understanding that there's, a, that there's a distribution to that. But I, that's a, when I see this, I always think this is the fundamental difference between ticks and mosquitoes which mosquitoes are they're in and they're out with respect to the, the blood that they're taking from the host. Right. This, is, um, this is investment on the part of the tick, millions of years of evolutionary adaptation to, uh, to say, well, we're going to stick here for a while. And we're going to make the most out of this blood meal. 
And the pathogens are part of that evolutionary process. So that arms race between tick and mammal and the backdrop is the pathogen and it's co-opting all these different channels. Exactly. The, the mosquito saliva also has some of these elements, but nowhere near as complex. Mm -hmm. Doesn't need them. Right. The other thing that's happening here is that all this is creating a sequestered, a um, protected, is one way I look at it, local environment, a um, microcosm here, a microenvironment that is uh, sheltering these bacteria. So the Lyme bacteria are now proliferating in the skin, assuming they've been allowed to do so for these, you know, after a couple of days. And this localized protected area long enough to begin migrating into the surrounding tissues. So they're not bloodborne. The bacteria, Lyme bacteria, do not migrate through the host via the bloodstream. Rather, they migrate into the surrounding tissues. And that's one reason why we see this big spreading rash. But the rash is not necessarily consistent with the exact bite site. It could be anywhere in the body. And as they migrate through these tissues, they find new organs to get into. And so they'll find a nerve, they'll climb up that. And so you get neuritis or they'll land on um, a joint. And God forbid that's a big joint and you have knee joint arthritis or hip joint arthritis, Lord knows where it could, could end up. And once they get into the synovial membranes, they're again in a well-sheltered environment, hard for antibodies to penetrate through, let alone you know, drugs that might kill them. So um, that's the way they spread. Give them time. And that's what the, the tick is doing for them. We've, we've learned the hard way that if we try to infect host animals that are not e ideal reservoirs for Lyme disease just by needle inoculation, it almost invariably fails. And when the tick bites, it almost invariably succeeds because of what I just described. This is called saliva-assisted transmission. It applies not only to Lyme disease, but a wide number of tick-borne pathogens, creating a thank you very much helpful assist from the that the pathogen is saying to its vector. Thanks a lot for helping out here. I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to proliferate before the host even knew I was here, let alone sending all these uh, molecules to attack or immune cells to attack me. I'm grateful for that and um, let you know when I'm ready to come back when you feed again, I'll be come back into you again. That's how it works. I don't know if they send greeting cards to each other, but... Uh, if there's an upside to that, it's that this, all these complex steps at least potentially pose avenues for interrupting that transmission cycle because exactly different targets, notwithstanding that there can be some redundancy in the system. So you knock out one and they just compensate someplace else. But Yes, exactly. That, for example, the coagulation cascade, there are many different components that they, they attack. So if you knock out one, it will still happen. This is an illustration what a mature tick bite looks like in a um, compliant host. This is a rabbit. And you can see where the tick mouth parts were embedded after this, it ripped apart. That's a uh, nice analogy. Yeah. You get the, the barbs from the hypostome even. Yeah, you can see that. What's happening here actually is not favorable for the tick because the host is now recognizing this is a tick sensitized host. And it uh, undergoing what we call a cavitary lesion. The, um, the dermis is breaking down, tremendous amount of lysis of um, fibroblasts and fibrin and so on is taking place. And you get a huge invasion of um, immune cells, mostly lymphocytes, but all kinds of macrophages in there and so on. And the tick is now feeding poorly and is feeding mostly on lymph and not blood not on red cells. So you can see if you look down at the bottom, the disintegration in the tick body, this, this internal disorganization says that tick is dying while feeding on this host. The host is rejecting it. And as a result of repeated tick bites, it didn't happen the first time, but after if you feed a second time and a third time, then the tick is not gonna make out at all. It's, it's totally rejected. And briefly, what I want to talk about here 
is what we call the ontogeny of a tick bite. On the, there's kind of like two sections here <clears throat> in um, the tick naive guinea pig or human versus the tick sensitized guinea pig or human. What's happening? And this is a super important to understand because a lot of people have been bitten multiple times. They're hunters, they're campers, or they're you know <clears throat> outdoors enthusiasts. And um, there's almost no way to avoid, avoid ticks if they're out a lot in their lives. And it doesn't all have to happen in the same season. It could be year after year. But th those of us who are in a kind of academic field and mostly are doing indoor stuff like bench biology instead of uh, out in the field are more at risk because um, we're in this first category, the tick naive guinea pig or human. So the tick inserts its mouth parts, the hypostome especially, the cement and all those anti-hemostatic mechanisms I just talked about, and silences the host or pinch um, pain and itch response. And um, during this period, initially no transmission takes place. But gradually, the tick saliva embeds it. The host does not reject the ticks. And so there is enough time for transmission to take place and you have successful Borrelia transmission. This is that individual that said, I know I took the tick bite, tick off, but I still got Lyme disease and we both know he didn't get it off. Of course, he wasn't even aware of it. Probably found it days after returning from an excursion out in the woods. And without in interference, the tick imbibes to repletion and falls off. Imagine your pet dog, for example, or some other pet animal that you've taken out in the woods. Now, there on the other side is the tick sensitized guinea pig or human. Here, many of the same processes happen initially, and no Borrelia transmission takes place. Of course, it takes at least two days. But now the tick saliva induces a major inflammatory response, cavity lesion is kind of specific to guinea pigs. I don't know if humans will do that. But there is a massive influx of immune cells, all the different types we talked about. And the large lesion is filling up with white cells. And there's strong tick rejection. In a lot of cases, if there's been sufficient frequency of tick bites, this will happen as early as day one. And um, the host is alarmed by the tick bite recognizes it and there's mechanical removal. And when the tick bite is disrupted early enough, Borrelia are lost when the tick is removed or dies, Borrelia transmission is completely blocked. The ticks are dislodged by the host or die, no transmission takes place. So tick naive people are likely to get infected. Tick sensitized people, even without any direct intervention, are likely to be less likely to get Borrelia burgdorferi. But I don't recommend that as a way of ensuring that you're not going to get the disease. Still have to be vigilant. Unless, of course, there's a vaccine in the offing. Unless, oh, yeah. Unless we get a vaccine in it. An we have a vaccine. It's, it's out there for, uh, for dogs and other animals, but now we have to get the uh, pharmaceutical industry to recognize the the financial value of making money on a vaccine now that they felt back in the late 90s, early 200s was not sufficiently valuable enough to fend themselves off from all the loose lawsuits that took place at that time. I guess you know that story. Yes. I was thinking more of a, um, an anti-tick vaccine along the lines of BM86, the cattle vaccine, cattle tick Right, vaccine. right. An anti-tick vaccine which would stimulate early removal. You know, the, the livestock industry wanted a silent vaccine, one that would not alarm the host because then they're irritated and they don't feed and behave properly. And the goal was to kill the ticks while they're in the, in the digestive tract. And that works fine. But for people, for medical reasons, we want, we want a salivary vaccine, an anti-saliva vaccine. This is kind of a uh, capitulation of what's happening with these Borrelia spirochetes. The role of plasminogen 
to transition from OPS A to OPS B so that they can be captured as they transit the hemolymph to uh, bind to cell 15 in the salivary gland that protects them. The spirochetes survive in the skin assisted by tick saliva. This is the saliva assisted transmission I mentioned earlier. And how the tick saliva creates that protected environment, down regulates host hemostatic mechanisms. I forgot to mention histamine binding processes. As we well know, histamine is a major stimulant for itching behavior. If you inject histamine into your skin, you're going to feel an itch. So uh, lipocalins and tick saliva have histamine binding capabilities and blocking histamine stops that process. That's how they silence the, the alarm that a tick is biting you. They also secrete an antioxidant protein, self-25. Angiotensin converting enzymes, which um, the kind of a mountain metalloprotease that blocks bradykinin, which is again one of the alarms and also plays a role in um, vasodilation. Tick saliva anticoagulants, we talked a little bit about that. Um, blocking complement, tick saliva contains enzymes that block complement, a lot of different enzymes in tick saliva do that. So that uh, disrupts the immune response. And other tick cell of proteins that block the lectin, lectin pathway, the lectin inhibitor. And ticks have a, a histamine release factor. This is interesting that um, later on in the feeding process, after they've blocked histamine, they now want to encourage it to increase um, vasodilation and increase, increase blood flow. So the moral of the story here is saliva on day one is not the saliva on day two, saliva on day three. They modulate the characteristics of the molecular components of their saliva to deal with changes in the feeding environment. So what they secrete on day one is very different from what they will be secreting later on in the feeding process in order to control and manipulate the host environment. And it's just amazing as you described described how millions of years of evolution have enabled them to not just get in there and start feeding but adapt to changes in the feeding cycle as they transit from one kind of situation to another until they're finally finished even ige may play a role in this they may be a, an ige alarm like there's possibly an allergic response that plays a role in this as well as others but that's it for another story. So I'll wrap up here. With a brief summary. And just talk about how ticks are unique among all blood feeding osteophytes by attaching to the host skin for long periods and drink enormous volumes of blood. And how to remain attached and feed for days or sometimes even a week or more. Ticks have to counter all of the host normal hemostatic processes. And they're, my, they're masterful biological engineers. They have the ability to silence the pain and itch response. They can block, uh, block blood coagulation, disrupt wound repair, block complement, minimize immune challenges of all kinds. You name it and they can stop you if you allow them to do so. That all breaks down with repeated tick bites, of course. But for the tick naive individual, if you're not aware of them, good luck, they will, they will get through it. The tick feeding mechanism enhances transmission and survival of the Lyme disease bacteria. We call this saliva assisted transmission as well as other pathogens. And the tick feeding lesion provides a privileged microenvironment in the host skin where the Borrelia spirochetes can proliferate, invade the surrounding tissues and get out throughout the entire body. Result is Lyme disease. And with that in, time to go get lunch, grab a pizza. And I'm done. What's the best place to, to get pizza in Norfolk? Um, Off the record. I, there's really no one best place. I would go back to uh, your area. <laughs> <laughs>
And um, what, Hartfield, Southern, Southern Mass, um, and New Haven, but New Haven is great, great piece of well. Right. Yeah. Forget Norfolk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Brooklyn. you very much. This has yeah. been great. And maybe someday we can do it in person. Yes, I hope so. Someday when we don't have to socially distance ourselves so far, the only way to get around is through Zoom. <laughs>